I, I, you know, I'm an, I'm an auditor, as you heard. Uh, so I'm a partner, and I lead uh, Grant Thornton's uh, Digital Asset Blockchain Web3 practice. I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, my personal journey to blockchain crypto, what our firm is doing, some of the challenges and complexities we're seeing. Um, and, you know, I, I know this, this conference is more about, you know, technology and innovation, right? So you'd say, what's, what's an accountant doing here? But uh, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, I mean, many I mean, companies in this space require regulation. Um, regulation uh, requires audits and, and accounting services. So, I mean, we're like a, I don't want to say we're a necessary evil, we're like a, an elementary part of the success of uh, blockchain-based companies and, and, and digital assets. So, uh, how, how, how do I get to crypto blockchain, right? So, my personal story is back in 20, 2014 when we decided to onboard our fir very first crypto audit client, a company based here in Boston. I'm based in New York, but I, I serve, con uh, I serve uh, clients all over the country, and I have a number of clients here in Boston. So I always enjoy being here. And uh, so back in 2014, when we onboarded our first uh, crypto audit client, um, our uh, you know, leader said, oh, who can, who can lead us work? Um, so th they looked at me and said, Marcus, you're the banking guy. You're it. And I was like, me? <laughs> I mean, I at that time, I all I knew about crypto or blockchain was what you read in the, in the newspaper. And as you can imagine, in 2014, what was written about blockchain and crypto was not positive, right? It was like the nefarious use cases and the, the Silk Road and everything. So I, I really had to get uh, within a year from zero to hero. And uh, it was a very interesting and exciting time. Um, we looked around in the firm and said, look, what, what, who, who are the right people to involve and how can we handle it? So our risk management team early on um, made a decision that if, we, if we're going to work in a space, that we would maintain and use our own fully synchronized forensic nodes, right? So we do not, we do not use block explorers. We do not outsource or use third parties. Um, we maintain nodes for the blockchains that we support, right? And the I, I think we currently support about like 40 different blockchains, um, you know, all the major types, and ERC-20 are easily replicated, right? So we could s stand up nodes in no time on ERC-20 basis. I remember like the the Ripple node was, was quite a monster because that takes a lot of... Um, space and it took us quite a while to to stand it up but what's interesting is I, I mean the the numbers of chains that we're supporting is also driven by market and client demand right if we have clients that say oh we're adopting a or b or c right we start working on a or b or c and then many times we work directly with the developers right so in the case of ripple we work hand in hand with the ripple folks and, and other nodes which is you know really interesting and exciting and we also um alert clients, uh, you know, in the early days, right, clients, they just adopted new chains and, and tokens, and sometimes we read, uh, read about it in the news, uh, and said, wait a minute, we, we're the auditors, right, we have to make sure we can audit it, so we have to establish a process, you have to give us at least two or three weeks time that we can do the research and say, is the blockchain auditable? And I mean, there was like a time in, I think 2017 or 18, when privacy coins became very popular. Uh, and we said, look, if you, adopt, if, you adopt, if you adopt privacy coins with the privacy feature switched on, then it's, it's game over for us because they have a vanishing trail, right? Audit is all about audit evidence and trails. If there's no trail, then, right? You can always argue with materiality, right? If, if it's like just a gimmick, right? Some, some companies adopt, uh, you know, coins just to say, oh, we have 300, 400, 500 coins. And, uh, you know, we work with like some of the largest uh, exchanges and crypto companies in the world, right? And you look at their business, you say, oh, we're listing four, 500 coins or whatever. And then you look at the trade and the revenue, uh, trade volume and the revenue that are generating 70, 80, 70, I mean, 70, 80 percent of, of the revenue and the activity is Bitcoin, ETH, and, and stable coins, right? So, 
Um, I mean, I'm, I'm excited about some altcoin projects, right? I mean, ETH has a lot of, the Ethereum blockchain has a lot of benefits, um, but do you really need like hundreds of coins and tokens that nobody is really interested? But, and it's like when, when the engineers Right, get excited and 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 then a driving seat, right? Um, of course, they want to have always the, the the latest, most accessible, most exci exciting information. But again, I as an accountant and auditor, right, I have to sometimes um, warn clients and say, "Look, we have to work hand in hand to make sure we can audit it." And we've always been successful in 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 coming to a solution, right? When when the certain clients ac adopted privacy coins, they then agreed to not um, switch the privacy feature on that we could get the trail, right? And sometimes um, doing on-chain audits can be challenging, right? The amount of data you need to process, um, it can be can be challenging, but it's also, you know, exciting because you work together with different people, right? So our blockchain infrastructure is housed with our forensic technology group. Um, we don't just use we don't just use um, our nodes for audit purposes. We also use it for forensic, uh, forensic investigation, right? I mean, what was got, what's gotten quite popular in the aftermath of 2022 is, is discovery, right? Or, I mean, we've had like divorce cases where, <laughs> where one of the divorcing parties was hiding assets from the spouse and the spouse said, I know, I know my partner has, uh, has some, Digital asset, is, I just don't know where, right? It's not, it's not the most, uh, um, it's certainly an exciting story, but it's not the most exciting work to do. But just to give you an idea how broad uh, the offerings are, right? And we're also not just an audit firm. We offer like a broad variety of, of, of services in the space, right? Started with audit. Uh, of course, tax services is always a, a, a need. Um, and we also do risk advisory in outsourced, co-sourced. Um, we've done a number of, uh, you know, consulting services, right? When before the, bef I don't want to get into accounting standards, right? But now we're moving towards a fair value standard for digital asset, which was a long, long way coming. Uh, but before, before the FASB finally moved on that point, uh, any company that wanted to go public um, had to put their, their, their assets on a cost basis, an impairment basis, right? So a lot of companies in the past, exchanges, they had recorded their assets on a fair value basis, and then as they were looking to register with the SEC, they had to reverse it and put it on a cost basis. So we did a couple of those projects with some prominent crypto exchanges uh, that we helped them figuring out uh, what's what the cost basis should be and if there's impairment. Um, Again, similar with with, regu with, with um, regulation that needs to evolve. I'm glad we we finally had the move um, on the on the accounting standards because if you if you look at like some of those crypto banks, right? I don't want to name names, but basically where you could deposit your crypto, you you, you could earn eight ten percent. They didn't lend it out um, to earn to earn the the, the, the rewards that you um, that they didn't distribute to you. Um, the accounting for that was like really lopsided. Um, you had to, you had the cost basis method on the asset side, right? So you, you hold all those assets, uh, price, let's say Bitcoin, right? Price of Bitcoin goes up, locked in, nothing happens. Price of Bitcoin goes down, you have to write it down and have to mark impairment. On the liability side of deposits, right? They were fair valued, meaning your deposits were fair valued, right? Price of Bitcoin goes up, liability goes up, price of Bitcoin does, liability goes down. That meant um, the more successful the company was, the more negative equity had, right? I mean, from an analyst perspective, it just doesn't make sense. And that's why I'm like glad that we finally had some movements in, in the, on the accounting side by the accounting standard setter. So, so um, another aspect I wanna, I wanna cover is, um, right, I mean, we work with like a broad variety of, 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 of different clients, right? Exchanges, uh, custodians, trading platforms, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Stablecoin issuers. Uh, what was really surprising to colleagues at our firm who you know know about blockchain, right? They knew 
all on a blockchain, everything is written, everything is, <coughs> is, is traceable. Uh, when we started working with exchanges and they, they realized um, at an exchange, 90% of the transactions are not written on the blockchain, right? I mean, you have a, a crypto exchange that has customers, right? Customer A trades with customer B. You have a book entry on the in-house system that doesn't hit the blockchain, right? The blockchain is hit when you uh, need to go outside. You say somebody is transferring assets out or transferring assets in, or you need to interact with a with a you know liquidity provider, right? But um, that also <coughs> uh, necessitated that when you have companies where a lot of activity depends on an internal IT system, that you have to have solid. Um, IT controls in place, right? Uh, so taking a step back, startup companies oftentimes uh, are very business focused, right? Of course, right? I mean, you have a business, you're a business person, you know, you focus on the business, bring in more customers, uh, increase the revenue, become profitable, and like accounting controls are oftentimes an afterthought, but these companies, as they're getting money transmitter licenses from the various states, uh, that comes with an audit requirement, right? You have to submit audited financial statements within 30 days after year end. Uh, then they come and say, hey, um, firm XYZ, we need an audit. And then you engage with those companies, you realize oftentimes they're not audit ready, the startups, right? So for companies and businesses that are startups, it's important um, to make sure you consider, you know, controls, accounting, finance, um, very, very crucial because we've, we've had instances, right, as I said, on an exchange, like 90% of the transactions run on an in-house system. If you have issues on that, on, on IT general controls, you may not be able to audit and get comfortable with revenue. I mean, we've, we've always been able to find a path um, to get comfortable, but we've, we've had like some, some interesting experiences, right? So for entrepreneurs, it's really important that you keep in mind if there's an audit requirement or regulatory requirement, make sure you have adequate controls, you work with the right people, and oftentimes it's to um, engage like a, a consulting firm that can help you get audit ready, right? Because oftentimes when somebody comes with, a, with an audit, I mean, we, we said, look, you don't need an audit, you need somebody who helps you get audit ready, because otherwise um, that audit will be not a good experience for, for you and not a good experience for us. Uh, what what we also do as part of our um, curriculum, right? When we say when our risk management team, and I think we were like the first top ten firm of the large firms that got into the crypto audit space. I think back then everybody says, "Yeah, we're happy to consult, but we don't want to do the audits; it's too risky." Um, part of part of that was not just having our notes, maintaining our notes, but also that we have annual training, right? That we train our people, um, that they understand what is blockchain, how does it work, how do you audit existence ownership, and how do you value it, right? So on an annual basis, uh, we host a in-house design training um, that gives all of our, first of all, the people in the audit space are required to attend it, and also gives all of our other people the opportunity who are interested to attend, learn about it, and, and, and get involved. We have that upcoming, uh, actually in, in September, right? We do one live session and it's gonna be a recorded session. But as we also work uh, with other members, right? Grant Thornton is an international member firm, right? I'm, I'm a partner and principal with the US firm and uh, we have member firms in other countries that are tied in uh, via a, a network of, of global global member firms, all use the same brand, use the same technology. Uh, various member firms have gotten involved with crypto, right? And it's like the spaces that, the, the countries, the jurisdictions that you can imagine, right? Like United Arab Emirates, for example, is a hot, hot marketplace. Um, UK, Ireland is very active. Malta, um, our, our colleagues in Cyprus, for example, are very active. Like some of our leaders, Leaders from our uh, Cyprus firm are involved with the uh, the University of um, Nicosia, Nicosia uh, which was one of the first uh, educational institutions that established a blockchain lab. And what's really interesting um, to learn from them 
they have developed an NFT pricing platform because we've been always struggling over the last, I mean, NFTs are not that, that hot a topic anymore, but for a while, as everybody know, right, N NFTs was all the rage when you had like the Saturday Night Live show with uh, Elon Musk and all the, the other guys uh, making skits about NFTs. Um, we were always struggling, how do, you, how do you value an NFT, right? They're unique, I cannot just say, oh, one NFT is like the other, but they created a, um, a valuation platform, like an algorithm that kind of like um, compares similar priced assets and then adjusts them for price. So it's really interesting to see what some of our colleagues and other members in other, in other countries are doing. Um, we support those member firms through our notes, right? Like the on-chain testing, we can, we can help them do that, right? They can outsource that to us because we're kind of like a global center of excellence. Excellence. We also um, go out and do training with the member firms. We have like a couple of uh, upcoming uh, trainings coming up, right? So we, we're gonna do training with um, our friends in the, in the Caribbean islands that have um, an active engagement with uh, crypto. UAE uh, is another area that have reached out for help and support from a training perspective. So I think it's, it's, it's important um, that you are in the space as an accountant advisor, you have to make sure your people are aware what it is, how it works, and, and, and are able to be con uh, conversational and, and, and comfortable with that, right? Another thing that we do is um, we've always we're also doing a lot of internal education. And you can imagine like back in 2014, a lot of people said, oh, you touch, you're doing crypto. I don't think it's a good idea, right? So we, we also always still have a lot of uh, internal uh, education convincing to do. Uh, but we also oftentimes engage with regulators. Uh, we've met, for example, with the SEC. Uh, we've had sessions with the OCC when Brian Brooks was the, was the head of the OCC at the time. Uh, FINRA, um, you know, any, anybody who's interested in, in, in speaking to us. I mean, I had, I had the, the, the honor in 2019 or 2020, the SEC's crypto czar had asked me if I, if I would be interested in speaking on a, on a stable coin um, panel discussion uh, with the FSB. So there was like a, 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 a virtual meeting, right? But it was like, people from all over the world, and it was like, there were like three panels. It was one, two were like practitioners, like companies, and it was like academia, lawyers, and accountants. So I was on the, on the accounting ones. It was really uh, interesting um, to see back in 2019 when banking and financial services regulators here in the US were still <laughs> hesitant and were believing, you know, crypto is just a fad, it's gonna go away to see how, how regulators and central banks in other countries already picked it up and, and, and you know, it, and evaluate the good, the goods, the positive and the negatives, right? Um, I mean, back then we talked about, you know, what if there's a run on the bank and, and all the stablecoin reserves are kept in the bank? What, what, what could be the outcome, right? And there was also at the time when uh, Facebook, Meta was, was considering to launch their own stablecoin, right? It was also, an interesting uh, uh, topic, right? You can imagine like a company like Facebook with a customer, inbuilt customer base of three billion launching like a product like that. Um, and they would buy, let's say, treasury bonds as reserves. I mean, they would have a significant influence over, <laughs> I don't wanna say fiscal policy, but they would wield a lot of power, right? There's always considerations like that in the, in the political regulatory arena that also drives development and, and, and the thinking. Um, I also just want to talk about a little bit about how we um, how we go about auditing um, digital assets because you know you can't just go in a vault and count them as as you all know right so we have developed um, a methodology back in 2014 and I think like most of the larger firms are using that now um, I mean the the Existence testing is fairly simple, right? Um, we get like the uh, the identifiers, and then we look at look them up on our own notes. Say, yeah, they exist, right? It's the same thing if you say uh, you talk to somebody on the phone and say, "Hey, I have a I have a, a dollar bill here," um, and I have to say, you know, how do I know 
you, you own that bill or you hold the bill, right? You can read the serial number, you can probably look up the serial number, say, yep, the dollar bill exists, but how do I know that you own that crypto asset uh, that you claim you own, right? So that's the, that's the ownership test. And for that, we developed like a message signing uh, approach that we say, hey, you use the private key to sign a message, you give it to us, we look it up and say yes, uh, and, and we, we give you the message, right? Could be like, it's a beautiful day in Quincy, right? And then you code it, you send it to us, we look it up, yeah, yes, that's the message we told, we asked you to sign. And that is a way that doesn't require moving assets, um, making them hot, because like one of the, uh, um, maybe also success story we had over the years is, uh, we started working with a very large crypto exchange and their, their, their prior um, firm they worked with, like a small, smaller firm, they were not able to audit the, the assets that the company ho held in, in cold storage. They basically said, oh, you have to make them hot that we can audit them, right? A lot of firms that don't have like their own node uh, technology or don't use block explorers, they oftentimes ask companies to move assets, right, around, uh, which would be like a, last resort for us if, if, if everything else fails. But um, we then were able to run our message signing approach with those assets that were in cold storage and they didn't have to make the assets hot because if they would have gone from cold storage to 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 um, to hot, the, uh, it would have caused like a market reaction that would have moved prices because such a large amount of assets that they hold, um, that would have not been a good, uh, a good approach, right? So that's like one of the, early success stories we had with our approach and methodology. When, when companies um, don't self-custody and custody with a third-party provider, we cannot use the measured signing uh, approach unless the custodian keeps the assets in segregated assets, uh, segregated addresses, and we can, um, and, and our client you know, holds keys that he can sign the message. Let, let's assume that's not the case, and they're sitting like in commingled addresses at a custodian. Um, then you send the confirmation, but a confirmation by itself is no longer sufficient, right? Um, if it's uh, a qualified custodian, nowadays they, they pretty much all have uh, service auditor reports, right? So basically a report that like an auditor issued and said, yep, the company has controls in place that safeguards the assets then you can rely on that, on those reports. If that's not the case, then you have to perform additional steps and oftentimes we do like roll forward and other tests um, in order to get comfortable. Um, I'm, I'm a, a member of the AICPA Digital Asset Working Group. I mean, we have a number of our colleagues on the Digital Asset Working Group. I'm on the audit side, we have colleagues on the accounting side and uh, there is like um, an audit and accounting practice aid out there on digital asset that the first one was issued a couple of years ago, but the latest um, update was just issued earlier this year, and we're currently wrapping up and soon to be published uh, an, an AICPA practice aid on stablecoin reserve attestation. There's also something that works on mining, and uh, but if you look at that guide that's out there, it also says, right, um, sending a confirmation by itself is not sufficient. You have to take a step further. And it comes to some extent from what happened at Wirecard in Germany. I don't know if you're familiar with Wirecard. It was like a very large uh, payment company um, in Germany and uh, uh, the auditor sent the confirmation to a bank in, a, in the Philippines uh, for two billion and it turns out there was a, a fake confirmation. The, the bank didn't have those assets, right? And ever since uh, there's like the move that look, just sending and relying on a confirmation is not sufficient. You have to get more support or more evidence that you can get comfortable with that. So some of the challenges that we encountered um, is, now I wanna talk a little bit about the regulatory space, right? When you work with, when you work with companies, uh, specifically companies that wanna go public, right? I, I, I talked a little about the lack of accounting clarity in the past, now we have finally the fast, make, the fast be making movements, but in the past there was no clear uh, accounting standards, right? So a company going public um, where you don't have clear guidance, um, for an audit firm that's a big risk taking just a leap of faith and then later 
something the, the SEC disagrees, and you have a lot of, you know, you potentially have investor lawsuits, right? So, so most accounting firms will ask their client to pre-clear positions, right? So um, there's still a lot of uh, pre-clearances pre going on uh, with the SEC, so that you basically, as the accounting firm and the and a client, they, they, they approach the SEC with certain matters they want to get clarity on, and then the SEC uh, considers it, and after a few weeks, they get back to you with their position that you have clarity how to treat it, right? Um, I'm hopeful that we're going to see regulatory certainty, because as you all know, the SEC is currently um, regulating by enforcement. I think some of the... Uh, uh, lawsuits like with Ripple or with Coinbase are moving forward and hopefully reaching a concluding stage soon, but it would be nice if we saw legislators get together and, you know, reach across the aisle, the <laughs> much talked about um, uh, approach and, and come up with meaningful, meaningful regulation, right? I think everybody realizes after 2022, uh, this is not the Wild West, we need regulation people's assets are at stake. And yes, it's a new technology and it's a technology, but still, if you handle people's assets, um, there needs to be some clarity and, and regulation supervision that something like 2022 doesn't happen again. So, I mean, I'm hopeful that we're gonna see that and uh, thank you very much for having me. And I mean, I'll be around if, if, if anybody has any questions or would like to talk to me. Thank, thank you very much for having me. Thank you.